Good morning. How's everybody? Good. All right. Awesome. Uh, yeah, what a great song by Kristen DeMarco. It is well with my soul, which kind of falls in a little bit about what I'm going to be talking to you guys about this morning. Thank you for being here, by the way, and giving me your time to listen to me up here. I really appreciate it. A um, couple of things real fast. I don't think we have anybody new, but if you need to use the bathroom, men's room's here, woman's room's in the back, and I have an announcement. I, Eileen, I did not forget. We're looking for a red metal water bottle. Still haven't found it yet. Uh, I come in here and out of here during the week doing stuff, cleaning, emptying trash, and I saw it. I saw it on the floor, so I don't know where it went to, but I'll keep my eyes open. So if you find a red water bottle, bring it in or call Bill or Donna or myself or somebody from the leadership team. We'll find it. <laughs> don't call. Don't call Bill. Uh, I have my phones up here because, believe it or not, I'm on call right now, so uh, this will be interesting. Um, I'm just going to ignore them, but... Um, <laughs> It should, be, it should be pretty interesting. There's a couple of things I want to share today with you guys. And uh, on your bulletins, as you notice, there's no title because uh, I did them. And I was <laughs> completely uh, super busy this week. And I forgot to put the Bloomin' title on there. So, uh, And Ty even called me or texted me, I think, while I was doing them, Friday or Saturday. And he said, hey, do you want me to do your bulletins? And I said, nope, I got it. So apparently, I didn't have it. <laughs> Uh, the other thing, too, is on the bottom, which I'm really bummed about, is, is we have a Facebook address and a YouTube address, and it's really awesome. And if you want to, you can go on there and watch us up here. If you miss a Sunday or you know somebody that misses a Sunday, they can go, up here, they can go on there and watch it. We're actually on those, on those platforms, so uh, don't forget about that. Uh, let me get organized here. I had a couple of things happen to me this week that I definitely want to share with you, but I'll wait. Uh, there's something, like I told you before, like I say every time I come up here, you never really know what you're going to get. And I know Ty goes through this. I don't know about anybody else that comes up here and speaks. And I know we used to have uh, a leadership team member by the name of Glenn. And Glenn would have this happen all the time where he would, Saturday night, he'd be all done with his message. And then it would change. And God would say, nope, you're not preaching on that. Start over again. This is what I want you to talk about. And that's happened to me. Um, and it, it talks about having trust. Kristen DeMarco talks about having trust in her song. And Saturday night, I sat there on my couch, and I'm like, okay, I'm done. Am I done? And I kind of had trust, but I was kind of fearful I was going to get another message. But and I, I got a little bit of something to share with you this morning uh, that hit me when I was getting ready to come here today. So I'll share that as well. But uh, I didn't have to change my whole message. So thank, thank God for that. What do you guys do? When you wake up in the morning, other than waking up, do you have a routine that you do? Do you have time that you put aside for God? Does everybody do that? You don't have to answer that. I want you to ask, your, <laughs> I want you to ask yourself that question. Um, I know for me that I try to spend an hour every day. And I say the word try because I'm human and I have my faults and sometimes I'm not always successful. But I have had times where I, I have to be at work at a specific time or the phone rings and I have to go to work at, I'm usually there by 7.30ish, between 7.30 and 8.30, I make my own hours. So I have that luxury. So keeping that in mind, I always give, I try to get, always give the father an hour of my time in the morning and I set the tone of my day that way. Um, and I complain about it sometimes. Like if I have to be at work at six and there's been some times I've had to be at work at six and I know it's coming, uh, Sunday night or Tuesday night or whenever it is, I have to factor in, hey, I really need to be up at 4.30. And I need to be spending time. I've got to give our father the time to spend with him. And I complain about it. And I think, crud, I'm going to be tired. Or I'm not going to get through my day. And I can tell you every single time I've done that, I'll go to work and I look at the clock and it's 7 o'clock when I get there. And the next time I look at that clock, it's 6 at night. It's that fast. And I've had all the energy I've needed to get through the day. So if you haven't experienced that yet, try that out because it's really awesome. In the morning, Jesus got up before it was light and he left the house and he went away to a secluded place and he prayed there. That's a scripture, actually. I don't have the address with me, but he got up before the sun came up and he went to a secluded place. Where is your secluded place at in your house? Do you have one? Do you have a secluded place where you go to? How do we get up in the morning? How much of the world crowds itself into our thinking before we get up, right? We get up, 
Uh, if you're me, you get up. If I'm really smart, I'll get my clothes out in, uh, the night before and I iron them because I, I have to look a certain way for work. And if I don't do that, that takes up my time. I get in my car, I drive to work. I get a coffee because I have to put Mr. Starbucks kids through college. <laughs> and then I, I go to work and I drive in traffic and I'm, I might be listening to the radio, but what am I listening to on the radio? What do we listen to? Life sneaks in and crowds those thoughts fast, right? We get to work and we're, some of us are on a keyboard. That's about 80% of what I do these days. I'm on a computer all day long and I'm just typing away. And what do I do when I'm done? I get in my car, I go home, these two devices are on 24 seven and my day fills up and, and I, I have to remember to bring God into the picture. He wants my time, right? It doesn't matter how busy I am, he wants our time there. I have to make the time. So I've done a little experiment with myself and I've actually made time throughout my day. I'll stop what I'm doing and I'll actually pray right at my desk. So it's actually changed the way I've looked at things just by doing this for a little over two weeks now. And I can tell you it's extremely, extremely positive. What are our priorities? What is our top priority? What should our top priority be? The Father, right? That's what he asked for. He wants your time. He wants you to be his priority. But where are our priorities? And I don't want to know. This is for you. Jesus said, first seek the kingdom and all these things will be added to you. And sometimes we have it backwards. We seek all these things first and we tell God, hey, I want these things. I'm going to get these things first. I'm going to get a cool car or a nice house or a nice pair of clothes or whatever it is our hobbies are. We want those things first. Then we'll give God our time. And we have that backwards sometimes. I'm not saying anybody does here, but we have to keep that in perspective. Sometimes we want God's promises, but we don't want to do what's required, right? And look at this world we live in right now. It's amazing what's going on. God says, make me your priority. Prayer and perseverance go together. If you're a person of prayer, you will automatically become a person of perseverance. How powerful is that? So I'm not sure exactly where I'm supposed to start with this, but I'll start now. So uh, a friend of mine has a niece and she lives in London and she's three and she's been through 12 brain surgeries in those short three years. This poor little child has been going through some stuff. And uh, so she reached out to me, this friend reached out to me um, and she said, hey, would you pray for my niece? Can you keep her in your prayers? And, and this was a couple, three months ago. So I did, I, I did what I always do and I prayed for her. I made the time and I prayed, I did it in the mornings. And if I remembered to pray, I prayed, but I did pray. Um, but I got really convicted uh, probably about a week ago, Thursday, almost, not quite a week. And I got convicted to pray Monday and not only to pray, but Steve reminded me to fast because he came in on a leadership meeting. He says, hey, I'm fasting today. And he's a whole nother person when he fasts. So uh, <laughs> he's still a good guy, but you can always tell when somebody's fasting. And has anybody fasted here for more than 24 hours? I know Steve has. And what happens, right? We drive through Old Town and we smell all the, all the restaurants. And if you're a guy, you could eat like a four course dinner. And if you drive by or your neighbors are barbecue and you could eat again. So fasting is tough for us, at least it is for me. So Monday, I, I made a commitment and I texted my friend Sunday night and I decided to fast um, Sunday night at midnight and cover the whole day Monday. And then I would stop uh, Monday night at 12 p.m. Uh, sorry, 12 a.m. So I fasted all day and it's a work day for me. So throughout my day, when I'd get a hunger pain or my coworkers are coming in with really good lunches and a lot of them go to, they go out to eat and they bring it back. That was hard for me. So I didn't, I didn't get to go to a cool restaurant and I had to smell their food when they brought it back. So what did I do instead of laying in my dirty mud puddle and feeling sorry, I prayed and it was amazing. I mean, it, it really got me through the day and honestly, I, it was so simple for me to do. So I go home and I share this with you for a reason and I'll tell you what that is in a little bit. So I go home and I get into my night and that's where I struggle because I'll eat everything all night long before I go to bed. I don't know what the deal is, but I'll clear out my fridge and I'll eat all kinds of stuff. So I, I, uh, I go to bed and it's probably nine, 9.30ish and I get woke and it's a work night for me. 
but I don't sleep. I'm tossing and turning. I'm not sleeping. So I continually keep praying and right at 3 a.m. I drift off for maybe 10 minutes at like 2.50 in the morning and boom, I'm seriously wide awake at 3 a.m. in the morning. And I'm thinking, okay, what's the deal with this? Why am I so awake? And I mean awake like I just got 15 hours of sleep. So I really feel the Holy Spirit come over me and say, it's time. It's time for you to dig in now. Now it's time for you to really pray at 3 a.m. So I do. I'm, I'm, I, I hear this, so I pray. And I, has anybody here experienced spiritual goosebumps? They're awesome, aren't they? I mean, it's crazy. And I'm kind of getting them right now. And uh, so I got them at 3 a.m. in the morning. I didn't even really get in depth with my prayer. And I'm getting these spiritual goosebumps. And they're, they're hammering away my whole body. So I like that. I want to I want to keep them. So I go deeper and deeper into prayer and I'm going and it, I'm hanging on to that. And man, I got to tell you, it was phenomenal. So I finished probably about four ish, four fifteen ish and, and I'm done and I'm already into Tuesday. So technically my my prayer time and my fasting for this little girl is is technically done. I did what I said I was going to do, but I kept it going a little longer and uh, it was amazing. So I shared this with my friend who asked me to do this. And I said, hey, this is what I did. I, I fast, and not because it's me. It has nothing to do with me. It has to do with being the instrument that's getting used. So I, and she, she's not a believer, so, but she knows of it. She knows of Jesus. Her, there's fa family members that are believers, and she's just the sweetest thing in the world. So I told her, hey, this is, I want to let you know. I think on Wednesday I texted her, and I said, this is what I did. And the reason I told her was because I want an update. I want an update on this little child because something's going to happen. I didn't get spiritual goosebumps for nothing. Okay, and prayer, when you pray for somebody, it isn't for nothing. It's something's going to happen. And Bill said it perfectly. He said, hey, you know, we need to remember the prayer, and you've got to believe in that prayer. You've got to believe that your prayer, number one, is being heard, and number two is how powerful it really is. So anyway, I sent this text to my friend, and all I did, and it blew her away. And, I, and, I, and that's not why I did it. Why I did it was, hey, you take a person who's never met this little child who lives in London and you prayed for her and you make a little bit of a sacrifice for her, no food for 24 hours, really in the grand scheme of things, big deal, right? I, somebody got on a cross for me, but I share this with her and she's overwhelmed at what this is. So Friday, I come in and I told the leadership team what, what I experienced. And then Steve told me, hey, you should, John Wimber, right? Womack, thank you. Andrew, right? right? Sorry, I've got a thousand names going through my head. He says, hey, they have a prayer team in London. You should, you should call the states and get the prayer team connected with London. And, and so now I'm a guy that I never was this way, and Bill will tell you, but now I finish everything I start. And I go probably way too far. So I thought, wow, what, what a great idea, you know. So I'm going to do that probably this afternoon or tomorrow, I'd really like to talk to a live body, but can you imagine this family in London, people come to their door and they say, hey, we got a word from, and I'm gonna drop your name, Steve, if you're okay with that. Yeah. Uh, Steve and Jeff from the United States sent us here to pray for you. Can you for, pray for your little daughter? Can you imagine how powerful that would be? You tell me there's not gonna be a dry eye in that house. I mean, they're gonna lose it. And they're, that's going to send a message to them as well. So that's, I, I love that. And it has nothing to do with me. I'm just the instrument. And I got picked to do it. And I got to tell you, when I thought, when I got the word to fast, I'm thinking, all right, this is, this just is going to be tough, but it, it was worth every second. So I tell you that to, we all have things we pray for, that we need prayer for and get that prayer. And you've got a team of people in that back room that are powerful. And we go through our struggles and our stuff together. And if you go back there and you believe, I'm telling you it'll happen. I've done it. So I'm standing up here telling you I've asked something in prayer, and it happened, and it was amazing. So please do that. Please remember to go back there. Make me your priority like I already talked about here. I've got to turn the page. God says, I'll give you all you need, but seek me first. Sometimes we want to collect these things first, and then we'll seek him on our own terms but we need to trust God on a daily basis. The day begins when we go to sleep. That night that you go to sleep, ask God, I've done this. I've, I've actually experimented with this. And when I go to bed at night, I, I talk to the Father and I say, hey, Father, 
give me an answer to this prayer or help me to dream a specific way or set my day for tomorrow. I'm ready to go. His, he's already taken care of your day. So check in with him at night before you go. So when you wake up in the morning, you have that communication with him and he's already got your day planned out. And there's nothing you need to do. There's nothing you need to worry about when that happens. Make it a habit. Make it a lifestyle. We're all, as far as I know, we're all believers and we accepted Jesus Christ, but we're all still evolving. I know I am. I change all the time and I got to change. And it's, it's, I enjoy it now, but it's taken years and years. I accepted uh, Jesus in 1995. So it's been a long time, but it's not an overnight thing for me. It is with God, but I'm always evolving. I'm always changing. And that's what I love about it. Pray about everything. Pray throughout the day. Here's the big deal with the enemy. The enemy wants you to believe that you don't rate it. They want you to believe, hey, you did such and such back in the day and you're a terrible person, whatever that sin is. And you may think you don't rate for a prayer. You don't rate to talk to God. And here's where you rate. Jesus Christ goes for you. Don't forget that. That's the best thing you have right there. That's the best backup. Before your two feet hit the floor in the morning, tell God to fill you with the spirit today. Prayer helps you stay connected with God. Stop wasting time. Get up and control your day, regardless of what you're going through. Stop saying tomorrow, I'm really good at this, and I'm going to confess something to you right now. I started a project on my porch seven months ago, putting in stairs that rotted out. So I started putting in new stairs, and I got the two wood pieces of stairs from Home Depot, and, I, and I, I was putting in the third one, and I kept ruining it. I didn't measure right, and I cut it. And, and I have a few carpenters in my family. I'm not one of them. <laughs> Definitely not one of them. <clears throat> and my tools are in the same spot they were seven months ago on my porch. That's the danger of saying tomorrow. Don't say tomorrow. Get it done. Stop saying it's too hard. Are you working toward what God wants you to do? And I think of the Janaries in this. He's in control. You can trust him. I'm going to read a scripture off my phone. I'm learning to get a little technical. I didn't want to plague Ty with having to look this one up too, so I did it. Trust in the Lord. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. How powerful is that? Does it say you have to acknowledge him all day long in prayer on your knees in the house and giving up food and all that? No, he doesn't say that. He says acknowledge him. Hey, Father, good morning. Thank you for planning out my day. Is that acknowledgement? It's acknowledgement. Now your, your paths are directed. How awesome is that? We make it this big production, and uh, we really don't have to make it a big production. That's not what he's looking for. One thing I want to share with you is I got a telephone call. Has everybody, everybody in here has been a reference for somebody else, like on a job or something? Has there any, everybody experienced that? So I got a call. This is a while back. I got a call to be a reference for somebody, and I didn't know I was going to be a reference. And I got a call, and I'm going to change the name. So this, girl, this woman calls. Her name's Heather. And she says, hey, I'm Heather. I'm from such and such company. And Joe Schmo called and was using you as a reference. Do you have 10 minutes to talk? And I said, I do have 10 minutes to talk. And I honestly did not know who this person was. I couldn't remember who this person was. They didn't call me and ask me if I could be used, if, I, if they could use me as a reference, which is okay. If I know you, I'll cover it. But I didn't know. And I didn't, and I, and I, about halfway through this thing, I remembered who this guy was. And I spent maybe 45 minutes with him. And he was at a restaurant with some other friends that we were mutual friends with, and I met him there but I knew nothing about him. So Heather says, hey, uh, Jeff, do you have 10 minutes to, to go over some, some stuff about Joe Schmo? And I said, I do, but it's going to be more like 30 seconds. And she kind of hesitates. And she's like, OK, never heard this before. So, And I'm, I'm a super nice guy, try to be. And she says, well, how long have you known him? And I said, 45 minutes. <laughs> and she stops for a second, and she says, OK. And you know, if, you're, if you've been a reference, you put the amount of years you've known that person, and it's not days and months, it's years. So there's been some people I've been a reference for where I've been friends with them for 20 some odd years. So it's like 20 years. So that gives the interviewer, hey, this guy really knows who he's talking about. 
So she says, well, how, what's his worth ethic like? Can you tell me a little bit about that? And I'm like, well, in the 45 minutes I spent with him, no, we didn't talk about work, so I can't comment to that. What are his strong points? What are his weak points? I don't know. I, I'm sorry, I can't tell you. I don't know. So she stops, and she says, I think I know the deal here. I, I think I understand. And I said, okay. I said, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to sit here and try to guess what he put down on an application and how long he's, he's known me. And I didn't want to put poor Heather on the spot and say, hey, how long did he say he knew me on the application, right? That wouldn't have been good. So I use that analogy as when we leave this planet and we're up there and we're at the door and Jesus is at the door and he says, I don't know you. That hits home, right? That's serious. I'm not going to be that person and, and neither are you, but I'm just saying get to know him. And I, I've used this analogy with friends before and they kind of get a little, not angry, but they get a little upset. And I back that up with, hey, you're not upset with me. You're upset with this. And I talk with other friends who say, and this just happened recently, they say, hey, I, I don't think I'm good enough for heaven, but I know I'm definitely not going to hell. And they have this mystical little meadow that they, they think they're going to go to and, and skip and run through the daisies and play guitar and sit around the campfire and just hang out with friends and be happy and do those things. And I say, well, you're going to be around the fire. You're going to be in it. And I tell them in the, since 1995, since I've been a Christian, I have never read about an in-between place where people go. You have a choice. And that choice is one, heaven, two, hell. And that's how it is. And, and at a minimum, do you want to really hurt your friend's feelings? No, you don't. But you want to tell them the truth. And you want them to get into this and, and discover it for themselves. And, and it's, we all have those friends that we, that we can tell that to. Bill, thanks for the water. OK. The title that's supposed to be on your brochure is self-love. And I talked with a couple of people, and I like to bounce ideas off people. Bill usually gives me a solid three months or so to get a message done. And I talked to Gene, and I said, hey, Gene, if you have any ideas, let me know. And if you have ideas, come bounce them off me. And I pray about them. I don't just run with them. But Gene says, oh, it's self-love. And she spit that out, like, immediately, I don't know, a month, two months ago or so, we had this conversation. So I thought, hey, that's really good. And there's a few people, there's more than a few people in this crowd that, probably need to hear about self-love. Did I, did I always like myself as a person? No. And I can tell you stories, especially back when I was in the Marine Corps. Uh, no, I didn't like myself. I didn't like my, the person I was back then. I mean, it, it, it's different, right? It's different. So you got to change that. Now, self-love can be a dangerous thing too, right? Because we can forget about our pride, or we can become prideful. We can forget about our humility in that. I'm talking about a different kind of love for you. And if you don't obtain that, you're not going to be able to pass it on to somebody else, especially when you're making a sacrifice to pray for someone. It's going to be different. Here's what I'm not talking about. It's not the kind of love that is selfish, not being in love with yourself, but a love to follow Jesus. It's about self-denial. It's about denying your flesh. And that's a hard thing to do. I, I, have to, I fight my flesh all the time. Okay, I have three channels on my TV that I'm about to get rid of, by the way, and they're hunting shows. And I, I have my certain ones, and I have my, I have my cooking channels that I like, and I won't bore you with the other stuff that I have, but I, I get into them, and I like the survival shows. There's a show called Alone. I don't know if any of you are, are familiar with it, and they dump these people off in the most harshest conditions, and they, whoever wins the longest, whoever stays out there the longest wins a half a million dollars. And um, it's very interesting, but... Uh, so those are the kinds of things I watch, but I have to remember how much time did I spend watching that TV show? But how much time did I give the father in the morning? Am I am I not balancing that out? We aren't looking for the attitude of what's in it for me. What we need to look at is what can we do for God? Deny yourself of your own fleshly desires. That's huge. And you get rewarded for that. Deny your flesh. Do not do what your flesh wants to do. Uh, live your life with un countable 
spiritual riches. You will be blessed spiritually if you do this. You will not be able to measure the real retirement that you're going to get at the end of your life, okay? We plan for a retirement. I'm actually retired from one career. I started back in it again because I was bored at home, and I'm here to tell you retirement's great, but when you get to retirement, you're kind of like, and everybody that's retired in here knows, okay, well, now what? What do I do? You have to replace that thing you've done for 25, maybe 30 years with something else. And it can be, it, you can almost go into a panic attack. I've been there about two weeks in. So it can be interesting. Being selfish leaves no room for feeding the poor. It leaves no room for laying hands on the sick. No room for casting out demons. No room for ministering to the lost. That's a huge one. All these things take sacrifice. If you're self-centered, you'll never take the time to help others. You're going to be helping yourself. The way of God is not to please yourself. Make a commitment to sacrifice for someone every single day. And I'm not talking about dragging your cross along and nailing yourself to the cross. Hold the door open for someone. I do that every day when I go to work with my coworkers, and, and they, they do it to me. Uh, I'll see my boss, and I'll say, hey, that's a really nice shirt. And he'll go, oh, cool. And there's another guy in my office, and I, he is amazing. The first thing I do when I walk through the door, he's usually there before me in the morning, and he says, hey, how's your day going so far? And it's like 7.30, and I'm thinking, I don't know yet. And he said, hey, I'm here all day. What can I do for you? If I can do something for you, let me know. That's infectious. So I, I take that and I go to somebody else and I'll say, hey, what can I do for you today? You know, what, what do you need? Pass that along. Give someone your time. That's a big one. I'm huge on that. Check on them. Encourage them. Bill, great encourager. I don't know. You said something to me this week and I, I kind of remember it, but uh, I've, I forgot most of it. But Bill is an awesome encourager. If you need encouragement, call him. It's amazing. Pray for someone. Take the time to to pray for someone. Praying is not always an easy thing, right? It takes time. you got to get into the mode. That's why I like to do it in the morning before the, the world corrupts my mind, uh, per se, with garbage that I have to do at work all the time. So that's not the kind of love that I'm trying to tell you about right now. Loving yourself for the right way. A lot of people don't like who they are. Is everybody happy? Are we, we're always striving to change, right? I know I am. I, I try to change every day, and I have the attitude of I learn something new every single day, not only at my job, but in my walk with God. I learn something every single day. You are a masterpiece made in the image of God. This is the way we need to look at ourselves if you have self-doubt. If you don't get along with who you are, you're not going to get along with other people. Every one of us has a story here. Okay, Ty, I'm ready for Matthew 22:39. Ty's going to put a scripture on the board, or up here. A second is equality, important. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is in the second commandment. It's pretty important if it's up there in the top ten, but this is number two. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do we do that? Are we loving our neighbor? Everybody knows what the neighbor is, right? We might have that obnoxious neighbor that lives in our street, but I'm talking about everybody. What this is referring to is your neighbor, is everyone. Be ready to serve them. There's, trust me, there's people I don't want to serve, but you know what? I'm going to do it because I want to set the example. I want to set, I want to let them know, hey, you're, you're loved in some way, shape, or form. Be kind and merciful. Be good to yourself. It's the best thing you can do for your family and friends. Not with arrogance, not with pride. We all have family that are tough, right? I have them in, everybody's got them, I got them. Trust me, they're tough. But we need to love them. Somebody asked me the other day, we got into, believe it or not, at work, somebody asked me about LGBT. Am I saying that right? The little acronym. And they said, hey, if some, one of them confronted you on something, what would your attitude be towards them? And I said, I would do what I'm supposed to do and I would love them. I would love them. It's not for me to judge them. Do I, do, I, do I want to instill change in that? Yeah, sure. Of course I do. But my first commandment, it's a command by God, is to love them. That's huge. Okay, Ty, I'm ready for 1 Corinthians 13.4. He's on the ball. You guys good? Everybody's okay? All right. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud. That's huge, right? We've all read 1 Corinthians. 
It's huge. It goes on. But this is the kind of love you need to strive for. We're not looking to be proud. We're not looking for, for anything out of that other than giving people love. A lot of people go through life against themselves. They hang on to negativity. They compare themselves to someone else or something else. How many times have we compared? I compare myself to someone else every now and again. I, I don't much anymore, but on Sundays when I used to watch football, I would compare myself to like a Peyton Manning. And what does Peyton Manning have? He's got a lot of money, right? He's got a lot of cool cars, I'm sure. Uh, he's got a lot of material things. Um, we can't compare ourselves to someone like that. It's very, very unhealthy to do that. Do you limit your own ability? Do we put ourselves down? Stop focusing on what's wrong with you and start focusing on what's right with you. Start that day out. I do things sometimes in my house, and I just did this yesterday. I can't remember what it was I was talking to myself about, but I talk aloud in my house, and I've, I've said this before. I leave my windows open and my sliding glass door when the weather's nice, like at night and early in the morning, but I have neighbors that walk their dogs, and they, especially across the street, they sit on this screened-in porch, and I, I'll be doing something in my house, and it just happened Friday, and I'm like, you idiot. Why did you do that? But I got to change that, right? I got to change that. I, you can't, I can't really, that's where I set the foundation for really not loving myself, as small as that is, and I do that quite often, and I have to stop, and I'm using myself as an example. We've all made mistakes in our lives, but it takes more, there's more right with you than what's wrong with you, trust me, and there's... There's more than a few people in this room, and um, I talked to it this morning with somebody, and I do a specific job, and I, and I love my job, and I really work for my victims, and I have a lot of, I, I have way more, for those of you who don't know, I'm a detective again, and I'm a normal detective now. I don't know if that's the right, the right way to say it. I used to be a narcotics detective, now I'm a regular detective, and um, so I have a plethora of different cases that I am not used to working, and it's very, very hard. And I probably have six or seven sex offense cases that I'm working right now, and they range from age from five uh, all the way up to, I think my youngest victim now is 22. And it comes out in different ways. You know, they go to counseling and boom, it fires out. And it's, it's tough to, to deal with that, but... Um, I have to give them the best I can give them. I have to have the right attitude. And people have come up to me here and they're like, hey, I did this, this, and this in my past. And, but now I'm this person. I've, I've overcome that. And we talked about that this morning. And I'm getting spiritual goosebumps again. And I say the same thing all the time, and I've told you this in the past too, Courtney. That is better than a winning lottery ticket. I don't care what the lottery number is. It could be what it just recently was, $1.2 billion. I pray for the person that won that because I wouldn't want it. But that's better to me than a winning lottery ticket when someone comes up to me and says, man, I, I'm, and it has nothing to do with me. It really doesn't. I don't look at it that way. I'm just the tool, and I've said it before. I'm that old rusty shovel. It doesn't always get used to do a job, but when I do do a job, I try to do it the best I can. And that's the reward is when somebody says, man, I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. I can almost rest. I rest now. And it's hard to understand. It's hard for me to get it out to you in a way you may understand it. But it's just, I know that person's squared away now. And it's super powerful. And that's the reward. You can't give me a month-long vacation in Tahiti for doing a good job. I don't want it. I want to know that you're OK. And, and you guys are the, are the rock. You guys are my motivation because I'm, I'm just Jeff. I went through a pretty stinking good life. I have two parents. Uh, my dad's uh, passed away. He's with the Lord. My mom is still here. And my life is a joke. My li I grew up in a nice house with my parents drove nice cars, Mercedes, Porsches. Um, I was spoiled growing up. When I asked for something, I got it. I was that guy. So I, I, I've, I've been my own worst test. But I hear your stories. And that's where it's really at. That's you've overcome something so tough and so hard, but you did it and you got there and now you're here and you've, you've accomplished it. And that's, that's the coolest thing in the world. And you can't give me anything, but when you come up to me and you say, hey, I'm good, man, it's, it's awesome. It's awesome. I had a person recently, uh, 
he hugs really hard. I, I'm, I'm 57 years old, or I'll be 57 here shortly, and he came up to me and grabbed a hold of me, and he's a big, muscular guy, and I, and bef I see him coming, and I'm like, dude, just go easy, go easy, and he grabs a hold of me, and he just pulls all the air out of my lungs, and I'm like, oh, gosh, dude, and he goes, hey, man, are you okay, and, and um, he was a tough dude back in the day, and I actually did a, a search warrant on his house, and I actually wound up meeting him on the second story, and he lived in Lower Oak Creek. There's a, a three-story house down there, and it's got an indoor pool. You'd never know, but it does, and it's a three-story house, and it's huge. Well, he books out of the window onto the roof, and I'm going after him, and I'm in all my gear, so I'm trying to fit through the window, and we're out on the roof, and there's like this much room, and it's two stories up, and we're on the highest part of the roof, and he's standing there, and he could take me in a minute. He's super big, and uh, I'm like, what are we going to do, man? And he goes... Let's go inside. Thank God. So we, because I don't think I would have won. So we go inside and we talk and we have a really good talk. And, and I thank God that I was in the mode of being more of a Christian man than I was a cop. Yeah. I wasn't in cop mode. So uh, I'm talking with him and we have a really good conversation. And long story short, because of what he had done, he went to prison for a couple years. So I get a letter from him about a year and a half in. And I get, it at the, I get it at the sheriff's office. I was working out there. And I'm reading this letter, and i am got tears streaming down my face. And he's like, dude, you saved my life. You have no idea. And I'm like, I have nothing to do with this. I don't see how I have anything to do with that. But that's how he perceived it. So he gets, he, he gets out, and um, he connects up with me. And I'm at, uh, everybody remembers where the Ming house was? It's, it's a flat piece of concrete now. So he, calls, he gets with me and he goes, let's go. I'm going to buy you lunch at the Ming house. And he calls my cell phone. And I said, okay, I'll meet you, at the, I'll meet you in the parking lot. So I go to the parking lot. And he's huge. And he's wearing a, a tank top. And he's all covered in tats. And I'm, I'm kind of dressed like this, you know. And I, I walk up to him. And he's another one. Dude, go easy on me if you hug me. And he grabs a hold of me. And again, he takes all the air out of my lungs. And one of my buddies is on duty for Cottonwood PD. And he sees this. And he calls me on the cell phone real quick, and he goes, dude, are you okay? Are you all right? That guy's trying to, you know, he's trying to suffocate you. Are you all right? I'm like, I'm good, thank you. And I'm still, like, in the hug, you know. I'm like, just trying to talk. So we go have lunch, and then he, just, I'm going to try to keep it together, invites me to his wedding. So we, we go to the wedding. Bill and Donna are there, and we go to the wedding, and I'm just like, man, talk about humility. Talk about getting a dose of humility. And it was just awesome. It was awesome. And he's, he went through a bad time. And I, we used to baptize people. I don't think we have any pictures of it. I had this huge hot tub. A ten, I'm sorry to admit, I did own a $10,000 hot tub at one time. I don't anymore. And it was beautiful. It was top of the line, had all these different color lights. And you could do stuff and time it. And it would turn on. And I was in that thing every night in the wintertime. I'd get off at 12 or 2 in the morning. And I'd go sit in that thing. And I'd spend a lot of time with God in that hot tub. But anyway, in the summertime, I, let it, I turned it off. It wasn't working. And I, we would baptize people in my hot tub. So of course, I had everything that could go with it, the best teak wood in the world. And I had stairs going up. And uh, he's, it's time for him to get baptized. I can't remember if this was before or after the wedding. And he has a back issue. He's got this thing in his back, this electrode thing. And when his muscles give out in his back, he, it automatically charges an electrical charge, which has got to be just on, it's got to be brutal. And it charges his spine so he can stand up straight. And I'll never forget this. He's trying to climb the stairs to get baptized. There's only three. And I don't know who was in the hot tub with me. It might have been you, Bill. And I grab a hold of his left arm. Somebody grabs a hold of his right arm. And I feel all his muscles tense. He, the enemy is doing everything they can to keep this dude out of the hot tub to get baptized. And I got him. And he's falling back. And I'm pulling him forward, and I'm trying to balance this 200-plus pound piece of muscle into this hot tub. And I'm, at the th I'm thinking, no way, man. You're coming in here. I don't care what kind of pain you're in. You are getting in the water. I'm not saying that, but I'm thinking that. And he gets in, and he gets baptized, and he, he gets out. We help him out, and he's there. And you can, start to see the th you can start to see it right away take over in him. And it was the coolest thing ever. And this was prior to the Ming House thing. So he's completely healed when I see him for lunch. He has, I think, the, the apparatus. I don't know what it's called. I'm sorry. But it gets, it gets taken out of his back, and he's healed 100%. Now he lives in California. He's married, living a productive life. And this is a guy that went through complete mayhem in his life. 
and he came around. And I continually prayed for him. And, it, and I'm not saying my prayers fixed him or cured him, but I'm just saying I am so blessed that I got, a, I got the time to be a part of this guy's life. I got to take part in it, and I got to see him grow. And um, it's, it's just, you can't, you can't measure that kind of reward. It's just an amazing thing. Keep the old man buried. There's somebody that was here last week. They're not here. And I told them to be here this week because he's going through a really bad time right now. And he got hammered by the dump truck. Uh, I'm being facetious, but he came back here. And he talked with me in the back last week. And he's broken. And um, he's had a tough go. And he's, he's said all the right things back there to me. And he, he wants a change in his life. And I'm like, listen, man, you need to come next week. And it has nothing to do with me, but it has to do with what God's put on my heart to speak. It has nothing to do with me being up here. And, and I'm bummed he's not here, so I'm going to have to hunt him down this week. But what I wanted to tell him was keep the old man buried. I'm ready for Romans 6.6, 6, Ty. Keep the old man buried. And I've stood up here and I've told you before, I love to dig up my old man. And I use him as my little fall guy, especially, and I'm not going to get into stories, but like when I told you when I drive in town and I, 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 I see other drivers driving and, and I love digging up my old man and putting him in the passenger seat. And it's, it's something I got to remember to leave buried. Romans 6, 6, we know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. Okay. Keep the old man buried. It talks about it in this. This is a short version of it. I, I read this through my, my notes. I have a MacArthur Study Bible, and it really gets into each and every scripture. Um, and it talks about keeping your old man buried. And if you're going through a tough time right now, and you're in an environment that's kind of tough, and um, can I use you as an example now that I put you right on the spot? Do it. Awesome. I went through this too, and Courtney shared this with me last week and, um, and, and this week as well. And when you're in an environment, and you're solid right now, just so you know, you're solid. And I'm proud of you. You're, you, you get... Jesus. <laughs> there you go. So you get in this thing with other people, and other people can bring you down, right? Toxic relationships, cut them loose. Give them the chance, minister to them, be a Christian to them. But after a while, if they're not getting it, you just gotta, you gotta cut them loose. Keep them in your prayers, but cut them loose for a little bit. And if they come back to you, then, then that's a blessing. Um, I had a stepdaughter at one time, and she was a tough, tough nut. Um, really tough gal, and spoke her mind without probably self-checking. And, um, and we had some battles. And we had some battles at the table, and my wife at the time would just do this, you know, like, oh, please. And, and I was good. I was a Christian man. And somebody told me, and I never thought I'd break through to her, ever. I never thought I would break through. Just at being peace with her as a person, it had nothing else to do with that because it was such a battle with us sometimes. As a matter of fact, it was kind of like this. She lives in Alaska, and she runs the some resort in Denali National Park. And she's a very, as you can imagine, she runs that whole place and she is a type A personality all the way. Physically, I might be able to take her best out of three, but it'd be questionable. Um, and, we, and she, from the get-go, did not like me. And we have all met these people, right? They, they just, for some reason, they, they don't like you. But you gotta roll with it. And somebody told me, and I battled with myself for years over this relationship with her, and I just wanted peace. So somebody told me once, if you continually pray for somebody, if you continually pray, and there's a reason I'm telling you this, and you continually keep them on your mind, that spirit in them will leave. It won't have a choice. That's how powerful prayer is. It will not have a choice. It will have to flee. So I did this. And there's things I've been praying for for a long time. And one day she comes to me and goes, and I'm thinking, Okay, here we go. I didn't get a chance to get my Christian armor sna uh, snapped on yet. <laughs> Just bring it. You know, in my mind, I'm thinking this. And she walks up to me, grabs me by the arms, pulls me and gives me a hug, and in my ear whispers, I'm sorry. I've been a loser to you for years. And I'm like, whoa. So it works. Don't give up. You're going through it right now. Yes. Keep going. Keep telling people. And I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I wanted you to hear that. 
Accept, your, accept yourself for who you are, make the corrections if need be, and move on and grow. You have more resources here than any place I could tell you. It doesn't matter what your needs are, come and talk to somebody here in leadership. I mean, we have experiences, we've got some, I'm getting up there on the age scale and uh, Bill's like five times older than me, so he's got a lot of experience. Sorry, I'm just kidding, but use us. Use us for, there, there may be some things you do. I'm, I'm, she may be watching this or may watch this if I get put on. I kind of hope I don't, but I have an aunt who's tough and she's coming out in October to visit with my mom and they're like two peas in a pod and they get going at my house and I've got to set the stage before they come out and I've got to put these conditions down like, here's the deal. You guys are not arguing and we're not talking about these subjects. So don't bring it up. We're gonna have fun. And she doesn't go to a church. And I, I, I can call her and tell her anything I want, and she'll receive it. But I told my mom, they talk every day. I don't know what you talk about every day, but guys, guys, do we talk to the same guy every day? <laughs> no. So I don't know what they talk about, but they talk every day. So I told her, I said, hey, she doesn't go to church. Here's what you tell her. And Pastor Juan said this, and it stuck with me big time. Tell her she's the missing puzzle piece to some church somewhere to someone. She is that missing puzzle piece that needs to be there. And someone may have the answer that another person's been looking for, she may have the answer that that person's looking for. So that's why it's so important to be connected into a church. And there's several of you here, and there's a lot of us that aren't here today, but you go to, you go to several different churches. You go Saturday and Sunday, which I think is awesome. You know, you're getting fed, man. Pay attention to that and, and absorb what God's got going for you because you're gonna be able to, to redo that. You're gonna be able to repay that, sorry, to someone else. And Courtney and I talked last week and we talked about Sorry, I'm going to put you on the spot again. You don't have to do it. But when you get up here and you give your testimony, it's powerful. It is so powerful, and I so urge you. And you might be super nervous about doing that. And, and we don't have anybody scheduled to do it, but we've had people come up here, some pretty hardcore people who have had some addiction issues. And they've gotten up here, and they've confessed, and they've asked for forgiveness. And I'm, I've done it. I did it. I came up here, and I asked for forgiveness for... Uh, a relationship I was involved in and somebody in the crowd, I don't know how many people, of course, the day I come up here to give my, my testimony, there's like 500 people in here. So I'm like, oh, really? But somebody in the crowd yells out, we forgave you a long time ago. And man, it broke me. And that was the coolest thing I've, I've heard in a long time. So it's just a release. And I remember feeling the release of that. And, and it's just an awesome thing. And I'm not telling anybody they have to do it, but think about it and pray about it. That's, that's first and foremost. Continue making changes, changes in your life. Have the attitude of finishing the race. Finish with confidence. Uh, tie 2 Timothy 4 and 7. <clears throat> I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. I have this attitude, and I showed this video up here a couple times in the past, over the past 10 years or so, and it's a self-motivation video. And then one of the guys that's talking and narrating the video, it's an awesome video, um, says, finish on E. Finish on empty. Make sure your gas needle is on E when you're done. You have, you have gone the distance, you're out of gas, but you can look back and say, my gas tank's on E. There really isn't anything else I need to do. That's always stuck with me. God knows you're on a journey. Don't hesitate. Just because you've got a bad past means nothing right now. He knows who you are. He accepts you for who you are. He knows your heart. Don't let the negative take up most of your time. That's easy to do. Don't allow the enemy to live in your mind rent-free. Don't wake up and get negative. I, the enemy tries with me all the time. Get rid of that thought process. Wake up in the morning and say, you know what? No way. Ty and I talked about this at the leadership meeting on Friday. Ty sat up here one time and he said, hey, I, I felt like I was getting, you have so much power. And we as humans don't look at it that way. We have so much power in Christ and our walk with Jesus. And we forget to, we don't look at it like we have this power. Pastor Juan comes in here. What's he call us? Good morning, saints. And I'm like, wow, you are a saint. Don't. Don't try to measure up to one of the apostles. It's not your job. You are you. You're a saint. And Ty said, anyway, I was getting sick this one day. I can say this, right? I was getting sick one day, and I, I, I wasn't having it. And I told the enemy, no, I'm not getting sick. And he didn't get sick. And he thwarted the enemy off from getting sick. It's that simple. It really is. 
I've gone through it too. I was at a family barbecue. I think some of you have heard this story. And um, I used to get migraine headaches, bad. And my vision would go and my left eye would flutter. And then I knew, okay, 20 minute mark. I gotta be on meds in 20 minutes or I'm going in the dark room and I'm done for two days. And then if it spread to this eye, they both went going, I couldn't even drive a car. So I'm at a family barbecue, my little vision's going, and I'm like, man, really, today? And I'm, I'm, I gotta get to Walgreens, so I was in Camp Verde, so I raced down the hill at Walgreens, and my family, they're all like, what, what's going on? And I remember walking in, and no one's in the store, just the clerk, and I walked down the aisle, and Excedrin migraine is all that works for my, in my headaches. If I take three and a sip of water, within 20 minutes, I'm good, I'm solid. So I get to the aisle, I, I break the aisle, I go down, look for the et cetera and grab it. I'm walking down the aisle and a voice in my head says, what are you doing? And I thought it was somebody behind me. And I looked, I turn around and I look, nobody's there. And they're like, have faith, go put that back. I heard that plain as day. So I'm like, okay, now I gotta trust. I gotta have faith, I gotta trust. I go, I put the medication back, my eyeball's doing its thing. I walk, I get to the edge of the aisle, gone. I didn't even make it out of the door. And the clerk's looking at me, she, I don't know, 19, 20, and she's like, yeah, what are you doing? Have the faith to try that. Have the faith to try that out. You know, I watched Jim come in the door, and he's in here with a smile on his face. Yeah. And, and I sit behind him, and I hear what he says, and he's into this, and he's happy. And I look at that, and I'm like, what do I have to complain about? Or I look at Chuck, and Chuck was on his little wheel cart, pushing himself in, and I thought about this this week, and I'm like, I wanted to come over to your house and take that and throw it in the dumpster. And now he's on crutches, and here he is, and they're making the effort, they're wounded, and you too, M.A., you walk in every Sunday with that, and I think I have a bad day, and I'm like, who am I? These people come here with, with assistance to help them get through the door, and we have to remember to think that way. So we need to stop, I, compl I can complain, boy, I'll tell you what, I can complain. But I think of you guys, and it helps me get through. I'm really running out of time here, so I'm going to the end. Okay, Ty, Romans 8, 37 through 39. This is just some motivation for you during the week, if you need motivation. This is where you measure up. Don't look at yourself like you don't measure up. This is where you measure up. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. I can't think of how any more powerful that can be. Romans 8.39, no power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then there's Hebrews. Twelve one. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially the sin that, is so, that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Those are three scriptures that tell you point blank, you are worth every second and every breath that you take on this planet, that you are a worthy human being to do this. And you earn this. And it's waiting there. And if you haven't figured it out yet, it's waiting for you to take and earn and do good things. I love these verses, and I love sharing this, and it's, uh, it's an eye-opener, and it doesn't, it doesn't mean you have to go through all kinds of calamity in your life. You could just be a Jeff who's, a, who's had a really good life, um, and I've really not had to have persevered. I've had my times, trust me, where I've gone through some garbage, and I've had to rely on God, and God needed to, to mold my character a specific way, and, and I remember going through some tough times in my house, in my living room, not really knowing where I'm gonna wind up tomorrow. And I've actually prayed to God saying, okay, I get the test, I get it. Let's just get to the end of it. I get it, I know how it's gonna turn out. I really didn't, but God said, no, I need you to, I need you to experience this because I have some other stuff you need to get through to you. I need to get through to you and it's gonna build your character and it's gonna build your faith. And at the time I hate it. Yeah. 
I really do. I hate it. But there's a purpose for it. Now I look back on it and go, wow, I really did need it. And it's super, and then there's, there's, it's all beneficial. There's nothing that's negative when it comes from God. So remember that. Let me uh, pray for you guys because we're out of time. Father, I lift up each and every friend here right now, and, and especially friends that I also call family. And I thank you for bringing them into my life. Thank you for all these people here, and thank you for what they do, and thank you for them motivating me. Father, I lift up everyone here that's going through a test and a trial right now, and I pray that if they forget to strap on their Christian armor, that you automatically do that for them. Be standing in front of them and tightening down that strap uh, to the helmet and to the breastplate, to the shoes, to the sword, to the shield, all of it, Father. I just pray you protect them from the enemy. The enemy has no power in anyone here, Father. They have no power. I just ask for victory this week in each and every person, whether that's financial, whether that's medical, whether that's a family situation, I pray for victory, and the victory is theirs. Father, I lift them up and I thank you. I thank you for everything you've done, especially, especially sending your son Jesus down here for me, who I don't rate. Thank you for him, Father. And everyone said, amen. amen.